to, to get started. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Professor George Papanicolau from Stanford University. George has uh, very kindly agreed to deliver this um, uh, opening talk. Uh, it's a keynote talk honoring Marco Avellaneda's birthday. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge also that it's very early in California and it's really a wonderful feeling to see that we are connected all the way from California to the Middle East, and I'm sure that uh, perhaps beyond uh, the, the two sides, all the way to Hawaii and to Australia. I, that's just my dream, but that would be nice. And um, so with that, uh, George, may I ask you to please uh, um, take control and, uh, and, pre and uh, display your, your transparencies? So, Okay, so thank, thank you all for, for this invitation. It's my first uh, time in this uh, uh, research in options. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially it's a pleasure because this is a meeting in honor of Marco Avellaneda's uh, 65th birthday. And let me take a, 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 few, a minute or so to say some things about Marco, who I have known for many, many years since he was a graduate student in Minnesota and then uh, in the mid 80s. And then after graduating and getting his PhD in Minnesota in, in working on homogenization and, and in partial differential equations, he came to Courant where I was back then. And he was work, he worked for a few years on homogenization and then he worked on uh, uh, problems in material science, and he made some very nice contributions there. Uh, what was really interesting about his research in material science, and it was carried forward in his work on uh, in financial mathematics, was that uh, he had a very strong, a very keen interest and a very strong interest in the applications. He was not satisfied in just doing uh, interesting mathematics research. He wanted to be close to the applications. And he always had uh, a, uh, a, a nice way to, to match the, the mathematics to the applications. He was very good at finding just the right mathematics for the applications that were needed, that, uh, that needed, the applications needed it. And when he moved into financial mathematics in the early 90s, at that, by that time I had left Kuranta, and I went to Stanford in 1993, and then at about the same time, Marco switched his interest to financial math. He pursued financial math with the same, uh, in the same style. In other words, he was not content in, in, in just doing the mathematics behind the, uh, what was going on, but he was really involved. He had a tremendous insight. He, still, he's, he has it he, over the years, tremendous insight uh, in uh, in what goes on into the real world of, of financial uh, uh, applications. And again, he has had uh, the, the talent, I should say, of finding the, the right amount of math and the right, the correct math to really approach the application. So what I'm gonna speak about today is, is, a, is joint work with Marco uh, Brian Healy from the uh, UCL in, in, in London, University College uh, London. Uh, my son Andrew, who is at uh, North Carolina State University in math, and Tony Hsu from NYU Data Science. And we have been working on, on, uh, on this uh, Argon portfolios, uh, the study of Argon portfolios for, the, for uh, going on to three years. We started in the spring of 2018, uh, on and off. And uh, I, I have been, uh, I'm very pleased. I, I shouldn't be talking here because um, I did only a small part of this work, but uh, I'm very pleased to, to present this work because I'm fond of it and, 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 and I hope that you will like it too. So let me begin by uh, giving you the outline of what, will be, uh, what I'll be doing. And I point out that principal eigen portfolios, which are constructed from the top eigenvector of the correlation matrix of equity returns. You will see in a, in a couple of slides, in, in the next slide, what exactly that means. With, uh, but you have, you have equity returns like US equity returns and you form 
a correlation matrix from it, and then you, co you take the top eigenvector of this correlation matrix, a symmetric positive definite matrix, and then you notice that uh, portfolios constructed from, uh, from this top eigenvector uh, track empirically the returns of the market portfolio. The market portfolio is simply the portfolio that uh, is constructed from, uh, from, U from, let's say, from U.S. equities, from the S&P 500, uh, and is weighted by capitalization, by the, the size of the, of the firms that, uh, that you form the portfolio with. And this has been known for a long time. It has been known from, from the, from the, for 20 years or so when first uh, this, this form of uh, constructing eigen portfolios, this, this, this started about 20 years ago. It started by physicists and then it was followed by uh, mathematicians. And there's a, I would say, a, a landmark paper. This is Marco Avellaneda's paper with Avellaneda and Lee in 2010 where the, that's a, a, a very interesting paper, and a lot of what I'm saying is, uh, has ideas from there. Uh, so all these things have been known. Uh, the tracking has been known. And the question is, why is this so? And that's what the subject of, of, uh, of this presentation is. So first, I will begin with, uh, with a linear algebra of eigenportfolios, so some basic things so that we all understand what we're doing. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state uh, an, an asymptotic result uh, this, uh, based on a model that, uh, that explains how the, the weights of the eigenportfolios really track the market betas, uh, the, the betas of the market portfolio. And that's the main result of the, that I want to present. And what is interesting is, is that, of course, the, the market data, the, the actual uh, U.S. equities data clearly follow this theory, and it follows in a very robust way. Uh, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, you know, why should, should we just uh, pretend that uh, U.S. equities are that, that all stocks are more or less equivalent and we form one big correlation matrix? There are actually market sectors. There are, there are uh, stocks have uh, correlate with each other in different ways. Some of them are strongly correlated with others and weakly correlated with others and so on. So that should be taken into consideration. And therefore, by doing that, uh, we can create more complicated, more interesting data structures like tensor data structures. And, I will, and what happens when you do that? Well, do you gain anything? And uh, how should you use it? Finally, because this is a, a meeting in options, I will, I will talk about how to do all this with options portfolios. In fact, to be honest, when we started uh, in the spring of 2018, we were trying. We started with options portfolios, and then we backtracked because we saw some things happening with options. There's almost there's very little research in options portfolios, and and how, what is what what is it that you should compare the options portfolios with? What's the analog of the market portfolio? Uh, we started struggling with this question and then we backtracked to equities because things are much better understood there. And that's what I will end up with. So here's the, uh, uh, we denote by uh, little r i of t, uh, the returns. In other words, the, uh, the change in, in stock price over the price today, the change over one day, everything is with daily data here. Uh, to think concretely. So Ri of t represents the, uh, the return of the ith stock, of the ith name, uh, at time t. So i goes from 1 to n. n could be 500, for example, if you use the S&P 500 data, or it, or it could be several thousand if you use the, the whole market uh, data. And t could be uh, anywhere from, let's say, from 252, which is 1 uh, the number of days in a trading year. It could be 10 years, which is over 2,000 days, or it could be in, in this particular case that you will see the results. Uh, N is 500 and T is uh, six years from 2005 years, 2014 to 2000, the end of 2019. 
And then we form the standardized returns matrix, which is the, the returns uh, subtracting the empirical mean, Ri bar, and dividing by the empirical standard deviation, H sub i. And this matrix is a capital N by T matrix. And then in equation three, as you can see, I'm forming the, uh, uh, the uh, N by N empirical covariance, sigma hat, which is, as you can see, the, what you would expect the covariance to look like, the empirical covariance. And finally, we have at the bottom in equation four, the N by N empirical correlation matrix which is just the, uh, the, norm the normalized covariance. I divide by uh, the standard deviation, uh, HI, it's the H, H, H without a subscript is the diagonal matrix of the HIs. So HI inverse from the left and HI inverse from the right, and that forms the cross correlation from the covariance, from the empirical covariance to the empirical correlation, or cross correlation. Okay, so, uh, now, this is a, the matrix uh, rho hat or sigma hat, asymmetric positive definite matrices, n by n matrices. And then uh, there are, is a full set of, uh, of orthonormal eigenvectors, u1, u2, up to un. Capital U is, a, is an n by n matrix. Its columns are the eigenvectors, which are orthonormal with each other. And, and so, and u1 is the principal eigenvector. In other words, it's the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. And we use that, uh, you will see a figure of what this looks like, or what these uh, eigenvalues look like uh, with real data that's coming up uh, a couple of slides down. So uh, uh, the, um, with the principal eigenvector u super one, we form what is the principal eigenportfolio, which is shown here in this unnumbered equation at the top, f of t equals one over c. C is a normalization that makes the weights uh, sum up to one. So we take u, sub, uh, u super one sub i divided by h i, and this is, the, this is the weight of the portfolio with a normalization factor one over c outside, so that the sums of the weights sum up to one. And Ri of t are the returns. So it's the, the weight multiplied by the return, and that gives you the return of the portfolio f of t. Now, first of all, the u sub i1 are the components of the principal eigenvector. They're not necessarily all non-negative. So they might be, as it turns out that they're mostly non-negative. There could be over, you know, when the, the index i runs over 500 in the S&P 500, there's a very small number of, uh, of names, i is a name, uh, that actually have uh, principal eigenvector components that can be negative. And they correspond usually to, most of the cross correlations of the stocks are positive. There are a few negative ones that involve uh, mining stocks and, uh, and, and things that involve precious metals. So uh, let's think of the, of the u i want to be uh, non-negative just to fix ideas. So this is what the principal eigenportfolio is. And then we can simply, uh, uh, at the bottom in equation five, we can simply uh, take this principal eigenportfolio as a, as, a, as, a, as a benchmark for the moment, and then subtract uh, the risk-free interest rate R sub zero, and then regress uh, the actual returns on the principal eigenportfolio. This is just standard factor analysis where we use the, F, the portfolio F of T as a factor and then we write the returns in terms of this factor with a b sub i being the weights. This is a least squares calculation. And the xi sub i are the residuals which are uncorrelated from f. So this, the five is a least squares, uh, let's say a least squares uh, representation of the returns using the principal eigenportfolio f of t. I don't write any more formulas, uh, of course, the, for the B sub I or the, or the residual. Now, leave that there for a second and consider the market portfolio, a completely independent portfolio, which is simply the portfolio uh, uh, Rm uh, of T, 
which is capitalization weighted. In other words, instead of the weights being uh, as here, uh, as you can see here in uh, U sub i, uh, U, U, U super one sub i over h i, this is the weights being the, eigen the eigenvector weights. Instead of that, we just simply use uh, the capitalization, uh, the the top, uh, uh, the capitalization, whatever it is, it it, uh, it it's instantaneous. Every day the capitalization doesn't stay the same. There, there's the top capitalization stocks like uh, Amazon, Apple, Google, and so on. They don't change rank very often. They change maybe on the scale of months or several months, but the lower capitalization stocks do change rank uh, fairly often. So uh, this rank is, uh, the capitalization is updated. So it's a dynamically adjusted portfolio. That's what the RM represents. This is the market portfolio. Uh, if you wish, the market portfolio uh, also tracks the index. The S&P 500 index is really the market portfolio. It's not, it's thought of as an index, but it's really a portfolio. And uh, equation six is simply, it is a model. It's not really here. We don't think of this as a regression in, in six, although you could. What it really does is it just simply takes the uh, market portfolio and constructs and confines the betas. This, this is the beta here, if you wish, the, the, the regression uh, of the market portfolio, the regression uh, of the returns on the market portfolio produces the market betas. But when I present this like this as a model, this is really the capital asset pricing model. I don't want to go into that, but there's an interesting economic theory that goes back to the 1960s and goes back even earlier to, uh, to the Markowitz theory, the 1950s for, for mean variance portfolios. But the point is, is that this is there and these betas are uh, they simply represent uh, to what extent a particular stock, the returns of a particular stock, to, to what extent uh, do they carry, uh, do they correlate or do they, do they connect with a market portfolio? So we have these betas, we have the market portfolio, and uh, the the fact that the principal eigen portfolio and the market portfolio track each other closely, as, I, as you will be seen shortly, that has been known for a long time. And I mentioned the Avalaneda Lee paper in 2010. Before that, there was a paper of Potters and Bouchot and, and, and co-workers who, uh, who were aware of that in 2005, and they wrote a very nice paper about this. And then in, there's a a 2000 or 1999 paper by a group of physicists at MIT who also had noticed that. And uh, so this had been known, uh, but uh, and then also the, the principal eigen like portfolio. Uh, so let me read that statement at the bottom of, of, this, of this slide. The principal eigen like portfolio is constructed uh, from the returns algebraically without any financial insight. This is just linear algebra. This portfolio, f of t here, is constructed purely by linear algebra. The portfolio RM is constructed uh, not with any financial, uh, not with any linear algebra, just from the capitalization, from what the market is, is, is saying. And uh, this construction has the connection with the capital asset model uh, is something that is warranted by economic theory. And that's where we go back to some very important papers in the 1960s and 70s by Littner, Ross, Sharp, and so on. Now, I want to relate the betas. So the main result of this paper is that these betas and the weights you, uh, the weights of the Eigen portfolio are, are very, very, intimately connected with each other. It's not just that the portfolios, the RM and the F of T track each other. It's actually that the that betas and the weights are very close to each other. And how do we make a mathematical theory out of that? First of all, this observation, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion out there, not in, in any formal way, but, but people think that uh, 
for example, why does why do these portfolios track each other? They think that maybe the betas are related. Maybe they say that the uh, uh, that the betas are somehow related to the to the eigenvector, the principal eigenvector, uh, which would be a little bit surprising because uh, why why should that be the case? Actually, you might even say, should the should the the, the should the principal the components of the principal eigenvector should they really track capitalization? Uh, I used to think that uh, that's wrong. That's not correct. They, they, that, that's actually impossible. They cannot really honestly track capitalization. Capitalization is changing. So the, the, the eigenvector uh, components are, are averages over the, over the time window that you have calculated them. So uh, there's, a, there's an interesting interplay there and there, there's some clarity is needed and, and that is provided by the spike model uh, in other words we introduce the the model covariance of the stock returns sigma this is an object out there you can calculate it the covariance of rirj and then uh, we notice that from equation six which is the this the capital asset pricing model uh, representation of the of the returns and the with the market portfolio you can write uh, this covariance in this form, in the form seven, which means that uh, it is the it is the the covariance is the is the it comes out of the betas. In other words, the betas uh, uh, with the betas you can the beta vector you can create a rank one matrix, beta beta star, plus a residual matrix omega, which is uh, the covariance of the of the residuals as uh, epsilon i epsilon j. Now, a model like that is in random matrix theory, going back to the terminology due to my colleague Ian Johnston in statistics at Stanford some maybe 20 years ago or so, maybe a little bit less. Um, this model is called a spike model because it's a random matrix omega uh, in general, and then plus a rank one matrix. And uh, the spike model, you can think of the spike model there's a very important result that goes back to the about 15 years ago by uh, 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 I would let's say uh, it's a result that uh, tries to dis tries to find out uh, when uh, how big should the, the the variance of RM of T in the front be or how big should the the vector the size of the of the of the beta vector b, so that the 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 eigenvalue of the uh, of the spike model of the of the spike part the beta beta star is buried into the into the omega into the spectrum of the of the of the omega of the residual matrix, and there's a threshold theorem like that, but we are not interested in that. That's 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 an application. It's, it's much more important in statistical arbitrage. Here, we're interested in when the, the gap is large, and you will see that that's actually what happens in, in, the, in, in the data. In other words, that the, the beta beta star part uh, in seven is, uh, is way out ahead of the largest eigenvalue of omega. And it is this property of the spike model that produces the result uh, that, uh, that we want. So, here, here's the data. This is with the SN, with the S&P 500 data. On the left, uh, what I'm plotting is the histogram of the eigenvalues. <coughs> Calculate. This is the the eigenvalues of the of the row hat. Uh, the cross correlation matrix. I'll show you that the row hat is right here at the bottom. Equation four. Okay. The eigenvalues of that. You calculate them with the. This is an n by n, 500 by 500 matrix. There are 500 eigenvalues. And you plot them over here, the histogram, and you can see that um, there's a, there's a lot of eigenvalues that have have relatively small uh, value, and you can fit them. This is this is not a a standard off the shelf fit. You can fit them with the Marchenko Pasteur distribution, which is a a very nice result that says that purely random matrices have a form of a spectrum. Uh, that is known explicitly its form. This is the result of Marchand Pasteur, 1967. is the beginning of, uh, of a very interesting part of random matrix theory. And here it is, it's that red line. 
And then uh, to the right of this red line, there's a lot of little stuff, uh, which when I actually stretch the, the, the horizontal axis, there is, there is somewhere out there, way out there, uh, here circled in, in, uh, with a red circle, the top eigenvalue, which is far out detached from uh, the residual. Now, the residual is not just the bulk spectrum that is represented by Marchenko Pasteur, for example. There are also some, a few other ones. In other words, uh, the spike model should have uh, a finite rank, uh, per, should have other uh, dis discrete eigenvalues or eigenvalues that stick out from the bulk. But it's enough to, to really concentrate on the fact that there is one really big one and to use that. And uh, of course, there are, there are other things that I could say about the, the eigenvalues that are outside the bulk and they are, they are there, but not for what I want to say now. So you can see that the data does follow the spike model. And now uh, here's how, what the asymptotic theory says. That's, that's, that's a, a theorem that uh, I was surprised by this when, 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 when it was first done. I, I didn't really expect it but it really clarifies what's going on. And it really says, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna state it, for, there is a paper which I cited, it's in SSRN, you can download it. Uh, there are some precise conditions that really say, uh, there are really two kinds of conditions that are, I think they are quite intuitive. One says that there is a large gap between the spike eigenvalue and the rest of the spectrum, okay? So, uh, You formalize that in a, in, a, in a form of a condition. And then you, you allow the n, the number of stocks, to, to be large, and you allow the t to be large. Now, in practice, the n is not large. It can be 500. The t certainly is not large. In, in, the, in the examples that you will see, the capital T, I forgot to say, uh, was taken to be 24 days. We, sometimes we take it to be 60 days. But here, for this study, the t was not so large. So. The asymptotic theory says the n and the t both become very large and the n over t is fixed. And the second kind of a condition that you need is, is, a, is a consistency condition. It says that the variances, as n and t become large, the empirical variances tend to the theoretical values. The h sub i's tend, tend in probability to the sigma sub i's. And then the theorem says that the principal eigenvector uh, of the empirical correlation matrix, which is a random vector, a random vector converges to uh, sigma minus one beta. In other words, the the the, uh, the inverse standard deviation multiplied by the betas of the of the empirical theory. In other words, the betas which which come out of the that are related that that are really the betas are the the, the the regression coefficients with a market portfolio, okay, are really related uh, in this asymptotic way. They're asymptotically equal in, in, in mean square uh, to the components of the principal eigenvector of the, of the empirical covariance. So that's what I say with words at the bottom. And this really gives a, a, the precise relationship. Now, does do the data really respect this? And the answer is yes. And here it is, it's, it's remarkable how robust they are. But what am I plotting here? These are the data for the years, the S&P 500 data, US equities, from the year 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And what the red line is, is the uh, ranked principal eigenvector ranked in size, and it, it, it has this S-looking curve. The horizontal dotted line that you see, the black horizontal line, is the zero. So you can see that it, the components, the, the red line stays above zero most of the time, except in the year 2017, it has a little tail that sticks negative, and also in the year 2019. And then what are the blue dots? The blue dots are the betas, actually calculated by least squares, divided by uh, sigma or by h, actually the empirical version. And then they are uh, ordered 
the betas are ordered according to the ordering uh, of the principal eigenvector. In other words, you you line them, you the dots are placed uh, when the index is is rearranged to match uh, the ordered index. That's what I mean by sorted. Uh, the principal eigen portfolio, and you can see that they form a little cloud uh, around the uh, the red line, the blue dots, and that's what the theorem says. The theorem simply articulates uh, what you're just seeing. Now you might say, why is 2017 the cloud is so dispersed? Why is 2019 the the, the cloud so dispersed? Uh, we don't. I don't really know, but. Uh, I mean, first of all, this is an this this is a, an asymptotic theory applied to finite size data. N equals 500, T equals 25 days or so. So, uh, or or even uh, actually here, it's not 25 days; it's a whole year. But uh, we have there are re there are ways to explain what's going on, and I, I will come back to the to how the the the, the dispersion around the, the red line, the, the cloud, I will come back to that. This is more interesting than, than just a, uh, an observation, and, and it should be pursued more, I would say, a little bit further down. Now, what about the portfolios? This is here. This is the, the, how the portfolios track. This is the figure that has been known. When I keep referring to what has been known, this has been known for, for nearly 20 years, that this happens. So what you, you're, you're looking at is, is that this is between uh, 2014, the horizontal is the year, 2014 to 2019, it's time. And this is a, a portfolio that is computed, that's what is computed with 24, a rolling time window of 24 days. So the blue line here is the, the vanilla PCA eigen portfolio. I call it vanilla because there is some other PCAs that I will show in a minute. Then the red is the cap weighted portfolio, the S&P 500 the red, notice that the blue and the red track fairly well. And then there's an SPY is another, another uh, index uh, portfolio that is constructed using ETFs, exchange traded funds. I don't, I don't need to explain that in detail. If you want to see, you know, to, to understand everything in detail, you can download the paper. Now, uh, then this is really, I mean, this, as I said, was known. This is the new result. And now I, I go into, into the issue of data structures. I have another 10 minutes to rush through the data structures. Uh, so I have assumed that the correlation matrix of the US equities does not have any particular structure. But the, the, there is structure in the US equities. And in any, any time you look at data, especially with options, there is tremendous structure. The options are not just a, a homogeneous set of, uh, of I, I will mention it a little bit, the implied volatility surfaces are, they have a lot of structure there that, that you have to take into account. You can't just put them all into one big vector or start one big matrix and start calculating. So what happens if you, if you respect the data structure? You insert it and you respect it. Well, first of all, what are we going to use for a data structure is the sectors. There is a well-established uh, 11 sector uh, segmentation of the of the US equities market. These 11 sectors are here. I mentioned energy, materials, industrials, and so on. And I have this, uh, and it's the, the column on the left shows how many uh, stocks there are in these various sectors. And now uh, the question is, how do I use these sectors? How do I introduce this uh, additional a priori structure into the, into the calculations? And that is by forming a tensor. In other words, now, instead of having an N by T matrix of returns uh, as a function of name and time, I form a, a third order tensor, which I have the, the dimension of the name I, the time T, and then uh, in the third dimension, uh, which, is N, which is 11 dimensional in the particular case, is the sector. And how does, the, how does, how does this tensor get formed? Well, uh, if I, if, if the name, uh, is in the K sector, then I use the returns R I T super K, which denotes uh, the normalized returns. Capital R is the normalized returns uh, of 
the name i at, at time t, provided that the i belongs to the sector k. That's what capital I of little i equals k means. And when that is not the case, I replaced it by the returns of the sector uh, eigenportfolio, principal eigenportfolio, which is the, I denoted by F super I of I of T minus F by. It's a comp the notation is a little complicated, but what it really says is it's just simply uh, the distensor is formed by the returns, by the sector returns. And when the, uh, uh, I'm reading the, the last, the last uh, part of the slide at the bottom of, of this is in words, uh, make a third order tensor out of the returns where the third dimension is the sector. And then uh, uh, you fill in the blanks. In other words, when, when the, the off diagonal things, if you wish, you fill in the blanks with sector principal like in portfolio returns. So we have this tensor. And now uh, we can form eigenportfolios from tensors. First of all, as you probably all know, there is no exact singular value decomposition for tensors of, of order three or more. That's, a, that's the major thing when you go from two, from a, uh, let's say, it, it's the standard thing when you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, a lot of things change. Uh, in, in, two dimension, in two dimensions, I mean ordinary matrices, you have the singular value decomposition, a very powerful tool. For tensors, there is no singular value decomposition, but there are approximations. So you can approximate tensors with sums, sums of rank one tensors. Rank one means uh, the, the, uh, the outer product of, of vectors. And then uh, that's called a polyadic decomposition. And when these constructions are done in a minimal way, you find the, uh, the, uh, you represent the tensor uh, approximately uh, or exactly as a sum of uh, rank one tensors. The exact thing is, is, is very unstable but the approximate one is, uh, is okay, approximate in the Frobenius norm. Then uh, these are the canonical polyadic decompositions, uh, and there is, a, there is an analog of the SVD, it's called the multilinear singular value decomposition, it's 20 years old. The CPD goes back further, uh, I would say, in the 1960s and 70s, and there's a lot of interesting mathematics there. For us, it, this is a tool, how to construct uh, principal eigenportfolios. And let me show you what happens. The, 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 spike mo the spike model persists for tensors. And so what happens? How, how do the betas compare to the principal, the principal tensor eigenportfolio? Well, here it is. Look at what happens. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. That this is, I compare this. This is for... Uh, the ordinary correlation matrix. These are, this is just the eigenportfolio constructed with matrices. This is the eigenportfolio compared to the betas constructed with tensors. It's very cloudy. It's not at all so close. So what happens? It's, it's getting worse. Of course, it is to be understood because you introduce this a priori structure, uh, you, you restrict uh, the amount of fitting that can take place. So is there, so that you might think that this is not such a good thing. I mean, it's, it's not as good as it was before. But in fact, you gain something. You lose something here, but you gain something here. What do you gain? Well, you don't gain here. The, the tracking of the portfolios is more or less the same. You, the blue is the, the tensor eigen portfolio. The red is the, the capitalization white, the market portfolio. There's the the, the dotted one is the, is the vanilla PCA eigenportfolio, and there is another eigenportfolio. There's another couple, a couple of the HPCA, which I, I don't want to explain. There's a couple of other things to compare, but they all more or less track each other. That's not the point uh, of the tensors. The point of the tensors is the following. Uh, and I, I will read this slide because I think it's kind of important. Do we get anything interesting by introducing the tensor structure based on sectors? And then the answer is yes, we get two things. We get robustness relative to the size of the rolling time window. It's very important in applications that you might say, how do you know how to choose the size of the rolling window to get robust tracking? You, we use 24 days, but it turns out that it is robust. You can go down to 18 windows. Taking small windows is important because it, it captures changes, abrupt changes in what's going on 
much better than taking a long window and averaging the behavior over relatively large windows. And what is really important is B, that there's far less dispersion, fewer outliers between the tensor eigen portfolio returns. And uh, when, you, when you look at dispersion uh, figures uh, compared to the, to the market portfolio. And of course, there's the, there's the downside that the, that, that the dispersion between betas and, and the, uh, the principal eigen portfolio of the tensors widens. So here's, a, here's the, what it is, is the top right, uh, the top left up here, this is a, um, this is a dispersion figure. Uh, you, 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 uh, you plot the, as it says, you plot the returns of the eigen portfolios versus the return of the cap weighted portfolios. And what you can see is, is that, I won't linger on that, is that you can see that they are very tightly, uh, the dispersion figure here is very tightly clustered around the diagonal for the tensor eigen portfolio. But when you look, for example, at uh, here, the bottom right, which is the vanilla PCA, you can see there's a lot of outliers. The spreading is not so tight. That shows that there is a, this is how you interpret, you interpret this tight clustering around the diagonal as a robustness. There are not so many outliers in, in the tracking as there are for the, for the vanilla. In other words, when you introduce the tensor structure, the sectors, uh, you, you, you make the, the, the outliers much more sparse here. This is very important. There is no mathematical theory for this phenomenon at the moment, but there are lots of ideas that, that we are pursuing uh, to, to make this uh, more mathematical. Now, this is my, uh, uh, my, my slide. I'm almost done. This is my, my slide. I only have one slide. Uh, for what happens with implied volatility surfaces. But fortunately, there is a full paper which has been published, which I have here at the bottom of the slide. And implied volatility surfaces, they don't even give you the chance to make them into, uh, uh, it's not a good idea to, to take these volatility surfaces and convert them into vectors. They have a natural four-dimensional tensor structure. In other words, you have, you, they are parameterized by name, time, strike, and maturity. It's a four-dimensional tensor. Okay, it's the implied volatility value when you prescribe these four coordinates. You construct this, this four-dimensional tensor, you normalize it and so on, you calculate eigen portfolios. And now here's the interesting question. Okay, is there, you, you have an options portfolio that you construct with a principal eigenvector, just like before. I mean, never mind that, why would you do that? But the real question is, is there, is there, some option portfolio, options portfolio that plays the role of the market, capitalization weighted portfolio. What should be capitalization for options? And it turns out that there is such a concept and that's open interest. In other words, it is the amount, uh, the, the capitalization is replaced by the number of standing, the, cap, the open interest is the number of standing contracts for each option. So you, when you weight uh, the price of the option or the, the implied volatility, of the option by the open interest and you normalize by the variance, which is really the vega of the option. When you do that, then the principal eigen portfolios and this portfolio track each other. You might say, what about the VIX, which is a very interesting portfolio for options. Uh, that the VIX is really an index, it's not a portfolio, but you can think of it as a portfolio. It doesn't track so well, I don't want to show uh, the other two. But the point is, is that the VIX is, you might think from, from this point of view, the VIX is a little arbitrary. The, 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 the implied volatility principal eigen portfolio and the corresponding one with the open interest and the vega uh, have, a, have a much deeper, I think, uh, connection with the actual data set that is there. I leave that as it is. And you can, you can look at the paper for, uh, I'm very fond of this paper, by the way. When, when we wrote this paper, um, we left a lot of loose ends in there, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So that's my last slide. Uh, so concluding remarks, for equity returns, analysis of the spike model provides a very good theoretical basis for explaining the closeness between principal eigen portfolio and market portfolio. Tensors do make a difference. 
and uh, whenever uh, there is natural data structure, it should be respected. Now, don't expect a huge difference when you go to sectors. And that I have seen that, and it's been known that in other fields, in imaging, in biological data, and so on, the key thing that respecting data structure brings is robustness. Uh, it, it, you, don't, you don't really see anything truly new coming out of tensors, but you see robustness, and that's very important. Uh, when you're dealing with real data. There, and there is, I should close and, uh, you know, I, I've been, I'm not really um, uh, in financial math like, uh, like the rest of you. I, I, feel much, I, I feel much more like an outsider. But uh, since we sta I started working with this with uh, my collaborators, it, it's been a very interesting, uh, a very interesting story. And there's so many open questions uh, that are coming up and involve interesting math and, and real world data that uh, uh, I, I hope you will find it interesting too. Thank you very much and that's the end. Thank you very much, George. So um, the tradition now, which has been established for video uh, talks through YouTube is to allow the audience from YouTube to ask questions. And um, and uh, in this case, uh, I'd like to perhaps relay some questions from the audience uh, to you, George. But first of all, let me thank you very much for this very nice presentation, very interesting. It's, it's very close to my heart and I'm sure it's very close to the heart of Marco Vigianer and Bruno too. So, so um, I'm waiting for the, for the participants to, to ask questions. In the meantime, um, uh, let me see here quickly if we have, uh, let me make a, a quick announcement while people start writing questions. We are a bit out of time because we, 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 we are a bit late. One important announcement for the audience is that we are going to have a virtual chat room or lobby, or you can describe it as you wish, through this link that uh, is being displayed on the chat on your right hand side of YouTube. Um, but uh, we, we are going to move to Google Meet chat later, um, uh, not exactly now. For the time being, I'd like to keep the formal aspect of the conference in the sense of uh, uh, see if anyone has a question. Perhaps also uh, if Marco or Bruno have any questions, um, you, might, uh, you might want. I do have a question myself. And uh, George, you mentioned um, the VIX, that the VIX perhaps is not a, a good, uh, let's say, eigen uh, mode for, for this. What about the, the volatility surface the, the, in the sense of the volatility surface of uh, uh, Dupier's uh, model for, for, for the, the volatility? Uh, the local volatility surface. Uh, do, you, do you think that could be used or could be uh, related to what you are doing there? Well, let, let me answer this. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfectly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there are. Uh, there isn't. There isn't a model involved here. There is a. There are. We took. We yes. took five hundred. Hello. So there, uh, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of an echo. An echo. George, would, would you like to turn off your mic, maybe? Yes, but okay. it's actually not my mic, but I will, I will definitely. Okay. So the, I think that the, um, first of all, there is no model here. We take this four-dimensional tensor and the, the implied volatility surfaces, uh, there are uh, 500 names. Uh, the time is, uh, we break it down into years. Uh, the strike, we took uh, seven strikes and then uh, and eight maturities or maybe, uh, uh, yeah, the, the data are surfaces. And um, now, even though there are 28,000 uh, option values when you look at the, at the data that we have used, the, the real dimension of the data is much lower. Uh, 
the, the data has been downloaded from option metrics. And so the, you know, it is, uh, there, there isn't, there, there's really no model at all involved here. If, in fact, one of the interesting things, and I think Marco and, and a former student of his uh, in 2014, they did uh, uh, try to come up with a model for the surfaces using principal component analysis. We didn't try to do that here. We just simply uh, did the principal eigen portfolio, and then we asked the question, uh, just like what happens with equities, what should play the role of the market portfolio? And we thought that the VIX was going to do it, but the VIX is not, it, it's not really that close. The VIX, they, I wouldn't say that, that the, the principal eigen portfolio of this fourth tensor of implied volatility surfaces and the VIX track each other, they don't really. So we asked, is there some other portfolio that does it? And we came up with this portfolio with, with the open interest that does track it. And so you might say, we're proposing another VIX, if you, if you want to be really ambitious that way. But the VIX is the VIX. It's out there. It's been there for nearly 20 years now. So uh, that's where we are. It, it is, and, and that's what, that's what this kind of data analysis, high dimensional data analysis does. It really, it really suggests other things, new things that might be of interest. I don't know if this answers your question, but that, that's, that's the, it tells you a little bit more about what we did. Okay, George. Well, thank you so much. Since we are running out of time, um, let me just um, uh, take the opportunity to uh, just uh, come up with one question and then we close. Uh, so I have a question from Rafael and thank you, Rafael, for using the, the channel uh, here. Uh, so, um, so Rafael has a following, Rafael Duadi is asking, the usual weakness of PCA on stocks is the market change of regime when correlations completely change. Does using sectors make it more robust to regime changes? And why, if so? Uh, I would say, um, Andrew is just sending me, sending me <laughs> comments, uh, answers. Uh, <laughs> I think short windows helps. And that's what uh, robustness. So to answer uh, Raphael's question, uh, if you use to avoid what he's saying, to avoid this change, this rap, this sharp changes that occur, you should be using short windows. The shorter the window, uh, the the less likelihood that you will be that will get caught through some rapid change taking place in the markets. So, if you use sixty days, for example, which is what is being used uh, in Avellaneda and Lee and in my work also with statistical arbitrage, that's a little bit long. Uh, most of the time it's okay, but during the crisis times, you want to have shorter windows. But then, is there robustness? You, you use a short window, you might not have robustness in, in, in what you're computing. It's too short a window, the averaging is too short. Well, when you go to tensors and you use the sector information, that improves performance. That is really the point, and I thank uh, Rafael for asking the question. It is, the, it is really the right question to ask here. Okay, very good. Well, with that, let's uh, close for the time being. Uh, we move on to the chat, uh, to the informal chat on the on the YouTube link. Sorry, so at the Google Meets link that you are seeing on your um, on your chat. So I hope to see you there. And we are going to resume at um, in about twenty minutes. Uh, to Marco Vigianeda's talk. Um, it's hard to say at what time because people are in different uh, time zones. So I'm only going to say in about 20 minutes at the half of the hour sharp. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you again, George, for this wonderful and very uh, nice presentation. Okay. <laughs>